Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the quarter one market view presentation from CBRE Cambodia. We'll be giving you an update this morning on what's happened over the last three months uh, with regards to Phnom Penh's real estate markets. I uh, look forward to taking you all through this this morning alongside my colleagues, Kinkasa Kim, our senior manager, head of research and consulting here at CBRE Cambodia and Ben Nesbitt, Associate Director in our professional services team. So we'll be looking today at the typical segments that we take a look at during these market view presentations, starting off with a quick overview of what's happened over the last quarter, looking into the residential markets, the commercial markets, and then we'll also be looking at uh, question and answer at the end. If you have any questions, as it uh, highlights on the right-hand side of the screen here, there is a Q&A button. And if at any time during the presentation you have any questions, you can ask them in that, uh, in that section of the, of the Zoom panel. There is a chat box as well. Please just keep chat for any technical issues. So if at any time you have any difficulty hearing me or any of our other panelists, then please let us know. Okay. Without uh, further ado, we will move on and start to, to get into the meat of the presentation. As a quick overview um, of the different uh, factors and insights on the sector. You can see that uh, the performance indicators here uh, on the left-hand side of the screen are really quite mixed. So we're seeing occupancy rates continuing a downward trend, but in most cases, the rental rates have either stabilized or are slightly up. Um, and this is in, in part due to what we've seen in the first half of quarter one, where the market was showing uh, more activity levels and a, a brighter outlook as some corporates and some retail tenants and some residential investors decided to push the button on some investments and um, action some deals. The only sector where we continue to see falling rents uh, over the the quarter was in the retail market. However, just bear in mind that these are still quoting rent. And when we're looking at the deals being done, they are still at a significant discount to the quoting rates. And we will talk through that in a little bit more depth, sector by sector. When we look at the GDP forecast for 2021, uh, the World Bank are predicting us to, to see a growth rate of about 4%. There are some higher than this. So if we look at uh, the projection from AMRO, for example, uh, it is um, at a, a more significant rate. Uh, here we're looking at 4.7% uh, from AMRO. Uh, and they are also more bullish on 2022 at about 6%, whereas World Bank are looking at 5.2% for the next uh, two years. We saw an uptick in the number of projects approved uh, for investment in January and February compared to what we saw last year. However, the value of those investments has fallen by about 40%. So quite a big adjustment down um, and the average size of the projects, uh, the investment value of those projects has also fallen. Uh, we can see this in the sector specific information that we'll be talking to you about today. And if you notice in particular, the very large number of launches in the uh, affordable landed property market segment, uh, this goes some way to explaining this, this trend. Um, however, just bear in mind, um, we will often give this warning, the um, approved investment values are often heavily skewed by the impact of infrastructure investments and other large scale projects, which can make a big, big difference to, to the value of the investments um, put forward. So, so important to bear in mind that the number of projects rose. So market activity level has continued to increase and it's, it's up um, 
over over the uh, five years here that we're tracking. So um, actually quite positive movement uh, for for the market and a good sign uh, that activity levels still remain. They've just been slightly retargeted compared to the last couple of years. Obviously the big story for the latter part of quarter one has been the uptick in cases of COVID-19 in Cambodia. And today we'll be exploring how this is impacting the rest of the year in terms of real estate performance. So back in February, just before the 20th of February event, we were very, very lucky to squeeze in our fearless forecast events uh, where we looked at projections for uh, 2021. And during that event, I said to uh, our assembled uh, colleagues and clients that if we saw a big uptick in COVID cases that you could uh, chuck my fearless forecast out of the window. We're not quite there yet. Um, obviously, the February 20th event has been pretty significant and has had an impact. And you can see this on the graph on the left-hand side of the screen, where um, back in the middle of February, uh, Cambodia was doing pretty well and most indicators were trending towards the baseline level, which was the, the same level of activity as we were seeing in February, 2020, uh, but they've now fallen back quite sharply. So uh, retail in particular, if we look at retail and recreation now, it's trending at about minus 47% compared to, to the baseline, um, which is obviously a difficult situation for many retailers and therefore many retail investors and developers as well. The good news obviously is that vaccinations have been started to, to roll out in Cambodia and uh, Cambodia is pretty ahead of the curve here compared to uh, neighboring countries. So uh, a really excellent effort there and largely spurred on by the generous donations from the public and um, big business here in Cambodia to uh, provide more resources for that effort. So that offers some, some hope that life can return to normal here at a faster rate. However, obviously still a long way to go. And if the February 20th event continues on for a significant period of time, then the impact of this uh, situation will continue to show up for, for much longer in the performance of the real estate market. As of now, we are seeing that the indicators are not yet really showing up the impact of this period of time. A lot of the impact was baked in last year because uh, most actors in the real estate market expected some sort of issue for Cambodia. Um, it would be natural to assume that if you look at the performance of every other country globally. So uh, important to, to note that some of the market impact from this event has, has already been um, accrued into the figures, whereas uh, there obviously will be longer term impacts, but we expect that over the course of quarter two and possibly uh, lingering into quarter three really depends how long this goes on for and how it develops further. Um, clearly, the, the trend line there in, in new cases isn't, uh, isn't good. Uh, you can see a, a clear uptick, particularly in the last few days. So. Uh, very important and uh, we wish that you will stay safe and obviously take necessary precautions uh, and hence uh, why we're back here doing more webinars, which we'll continue to do, uh, I think, for the rest of the year. Um, we expect this situation to continue to raise its head uh, across various different markets and is obviously a significant risk as people start to open up. COVID-19 becomes a, another uh, shows another facet to its complexity uh, and we uh, therefore can expect disruption to continue uh, for some time um, over, over the course of the next nine months. Okay, moving on from uh, what isn't too pleasant in news uh, to talking about 
uh, what was in the news over the course of the last quarter. Uh, a lot of it was to do with COVID-19 um, and obviously the vaccination drive that Cambodia has been having has, has uh, been showing up in a few papers. But beyond that, really the big story for the quarter is the push from the National Bank and Ministry of Economy and Finance on de-dollarization and the support that's been shown for that by Cambodia's banking sector. There have been a few new stories about infrastructure and particularly more energy generation plants and um, some items on, on tourism development aiming at, at the longer term. Um, clearly the situation in Myanmar is, is very, very difficult. That presents something of an opportunity for Cambodia. We have seen some instances of, um, of investment starting to look at Cambodia, whereas previously it was looking at Myanmar. Uh, Cambodia offers a, a potential alternative with a lot of dynamics that are quite similar, but a market that is, is pretty different in many ways. Uh, we are perhaps further through our development phase um, in, in some cases at this time. So um, that is a brief rundown on what we're seeing from the media over the last three months. Uh, and when we talk to you guys about what you're seeing, uh, it's really interesting to see the, the changing dynamics. So if we look back at our fearless forecast in 2020 and then our fearless forecast in February, the difference in the identification of risks that the market is facing is, is really fascinating. The top risk everyone sees here is oversupply, but really interesting to see that reduction in liquidity has come up to meet lack of infrastructure capacity as a potential risk factor that people are, are wary of. Uh, beyond that, geopolitical risks have increased uh, according to um, your, your insights and construction delays also starting to weigh on market sentiment, but they are lagging behind. We can see that the threat of international sanctions has receded as uh, it goes in, in respects of a threat to the real estate market, as has domestic regulatory changes. I think that some of those items have probably already happened, which is why we've seen some, um, or, uh, some of these risks uh, fall back in terms of your perception of, of how they're going to impact the real estate market, particularly domestic regulatory changes around the, um, around the capital gains tax, which has been delayed into next year, and EBA and the withdrawal of EBA in regards to uh, international sanctions of sort um, impacting uh, the early market in 2020. In terms of the effects of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how we see the economy, uh, February 2021, when we did Phyllis forecast compared to quarter four, indicated that there was uh, perhaps more people with a bit more hope, uh, but a lot more people with a lot more pessimism. Um, so <laughs> quite a mixed picture there. Uh, the no change and the slight improvement uh, sectors really shrank, whereas uh, slight deterioration and major deterioration uh, really started to, to pull away a little bit there. So we'll run this poll again at the end of uh, this webinar. Uh, you can let us know your thoughts and how you've updated your thinking about the impact of COVID-19 and um, how the real estate market is reacting. But really interesting to see the difference between um, the change in sentiment in uh, different, uh, different sectors here. So we're tracking here the difference in your sentiment between um, investing in, in property in quarter one, what you would look to invest in quarter one, 2020, and what we are looking at in uh, fearless forecast in February. So 12 months apart, most um, office market has fallen back the furthest, uh, whereas, and so has landed property. So the change on those has both been negative. Landed property still remains one of the top um, 
investable assets, according to you guys, but I think everyone is, is just taking a slightly more cautious approach to it. And really the same with Office, uh, the market sentiment now indicates a, a negative outlook on that, on that asset side. Retail has improved slightly. I think that's probably a rebasing of retail, but it's, it's still quite a small segment, not many people. Um, indicating that that retail would be um, of interest. And when we look at condominium, industrial and land, they've all grown relatively well. Land um, has always been a very popular answer to this question. Uh, so to see it continue to grow indicates perhaps that uh, the market is, is facing more uncertainty, which we, we know is true. So at least the indicator is pointing in the right direction. But really interesting to see the change in sentiment on condominiums. And this is probably down to a rebasing of the pricing. So everyone's starting to see condominiums as offering more value. So without further ado, we will uh, start to look at more detail of the different sectors. And I will hand over to Kinkesa Kim, who will talk to you through the residential market. Over to you, Kessa. Thank you, James. Um, without further ado, let's um, begin by um, looking at the um, residential market um, into uh, particularly the condominium um, sector. Um, this slide represents the uh, supply uh, changes in the condominium sector. On the uh, first uh, figure that we're looking at is the um, seven out of 19. Um, project been delayed from uh, 2020, which was uh, first planned to finish in 2020 and now is um, being um, all spill over to 2021 um, and that contribute further to the increase of supplies in this uh, market up to uh, 10,000 units in 2021. In the first quarter of 2021, we have seen um, nearly 800 units been completed, uh, equivalent, equivalent to around 7% of the total supply uh, expected for this year. Um, further down uh, in 2021, we're expecting to um, see more supply uh, being completed, but um, construction delays is becoming more uh, uh, concerning and becoming a, a more common thing in uh, condominium market. We have discussed this uh, several times, um, part particularly we've seen um, condominium developer are uh, being quite ambitious with the uh, completion deadline and um, the schedule of the handover, which uh, in many cases we have seen that uh, is becoming in a delay. Um, these are some phases of Sorry. Um, these are the phases of the new launches and uh, completion in this quarter. Uh, we have seen a relaunch of uh, Ling An Garden located in Min Jae District along Monsign Boulevard and four new completions um, that accumulated to uh, close to 800 units. Um, those completions are SH Condo, Sky Villa, La Trade and City Light who uh, has just launched and complete in the same quarter. Um, four of them added um, 800 units across uh, four districts in the um, Phnom Penh city. In terms of um, performance in pricing, uh, sell price and rents, we have seen an uptick, two upticks actually in uh, high-end and affordable uh, prices. Um, however, we've seen continued downward trend for uh, mid-range segments up to 0.4%, uh, but um, positive uh, movement have seen in high-end and affordable. Um, in terms of the uh, rental rates uh, per square meter presented on the right-hand side, um, across three segments are performing uh, quite positive and I've seen some recovery in uh, uh, across the three segments, although those are um, quite minor as compared to the uh, uh, changes that were uh, happening in uh, 2020. So this is still in a recovery phase and uh, we have yet seen that uh, we have yet seen this rental rate to um, catch up with the previous uh, high in 2019 yet. 
In terms of uh, quoting sell price uh, range uh, that you're seeing at the bottom of the uh, right hand side, uh, we're trying to present the uh, price range for uh, the three segments across primary and secondary uh, location. As you can see here um, in affordable and high end segment, there are smaller um, price range or smaller gaps in the secondary location, whereas um, bigger gaps in um, the primary locations, uh, particularly in the mid range and high end. Um, another part of the residential sector that we're looking at today is the landed property market, which was um, last updated in Q3 2020. So the, some of the changes we're looking here are six month change. Um, however, we also highlight um, first quarter changes where uh, possible. In the first graph that we're looking at, the um, dark green color are uh, representing the completed supply um, in as of 20, uh, Q1 2020. The light green in the middle are those under construction and the yellowish green are the new launches in uh, the past six months. Particularly, we see uh, we notice um, increase of new launches in Dong Gao and uh, Choi Chung Wa, which are both um, in the outer uh, ring of the city. Um, in terms of uh, launches in uh, new launches, um, sorry, under construction units in uh, um, by types of unit that presented in the right hand side, uh, we try to break down um, the, the unit type that are under construction uh, by each segment, um, particularly affordable uh, link house and single villa are on the lead in this uh, under under uh, are on the lead in terms of construction. Uh, particularly, we've seen a rise of uh, new launches of this type of uh, units in 2020, which is uh, continuing to be constructed and um, to be handed over um, in the following years. Um, this kind of uh, corresponding to the uh, new launch and under construction uh, supply that you're seeing in the first graph there, um, particularly these uh, affordable units are located in outer skirt of uh, outer ring of the city, uh, which are land price are more affordable and um, uh, the infrastructure are being rapidly uh, developed and very favorable for uh, the construction of new landed property projects. By the first three months of 2021, uh, up to 15 units, 15% uh, of the uh, 9,500 units that were expected in 2021 uh, being completed. Uh, and we are expecting to see more of uh, this completion to come around uh, later in the year. Um, these are some of the projects that uh, we, were, we were tracking. Um, on the left hand side, you are seeing uh, launches of up to 21 projects in the past uh, six months. This is equivalent to 15,500 uh, units, which is quite a lot. If you uh, look into these uh, existing uh, supplies um, that already been introduced and uh, be active in the market right now. Um, nevertheless, we also seen uh, 11 projects completed in the past six months as well. When looking at um, the pricings of landed property, um, we have seen that a price range uh, in terms of price range, minimum and maximum prices are relatively uh, similar to the previous quarter. However, in terms of uh, average price change, we have seen uh, quite a substantial change um, across all four unit types that you're looking at in the first graph. Um, the average changes are around 15% um, downward. This kind of uh, corresponding to um, our investor uh, in sentiment survey, which was presented by Jim earlier. Uh, landed property uh, used to be more, one of the most established um, uh, markets in, in the real estate market in Cambodia, but um, this sector is not immune or uh, being vaccinated against the COVID-19. So we start to see um, that COVID-19 economic impact yield in into the uh, performance or sales of a landed property as well. And uh, competition is also arising, um, affecting uh, some of the uh, uh, prices of the projects. Another factor that contributing to a lower sale price as well, it was noting that um, 
uh, landed property are getting uh, further out in the city, which um, uh, again, um, developer were looking for uh, affordable land for development. This is also another case that uh, contribute to the price change in uh, this segment as well. Um, this uh, quarter, our team uh, think it's a a uh, good idea to trying to uh, give more context to you by um, broken down uh, or compared the sale prices uh, across um, districts. Um, so we have chosen the benchmark of uh, 25,000 US dollar as a benchmark. Um, with this price, uh, you can afford less than 100 um, square meter of house or landed property in a central area such as Don Ping, Seven Makara, BKK, and then um, slightly bigger in um, outer ring like Minche, um, Chujungwa, and then even bigger in the um, uh, newly uh, developed areas such as uh, Po San Che, Dong Kao, Kung Bo, and Prai Pano. Um, the other um, indicative uh, uh, size that we have provided here is also to um, looking in the, into the difference between um, un the same unit types, but across a different segment, uh, namely affordable, mid-range and high-end segment. So um, looking into um, the unit designs that are being offered in the market, we are seeing uh, as low as uh, 100 square meter on average um, from the affordable flat houses um, up uh, further up to um, uh, closer to 200 and then um, 300 uh, US square square meter in in mid-range and high-end uh, unit types so this is um, to wrap up um, the residential uh, market um, next hand over to uh, my colleagues to um, discuss more on the uh, commercial markets. Hand over to you, Ben. Thank you, Kessa. I'm just going to run through some of the uh, commercial markets uh, for you here. We're starting to get quite a lot of questions come through. Keep them coming. We'll answer them very shortly. Um, so just a quick run through of the office market. If we look at the supply, and I'll talk more about the completions, but in the centrally owned office market alone, 65% uh, of the expected completions for 2021 uh, finished, and that was in two buildings. So there's not that much more centrally owned supply to come for the rest of the year, which is pretty good if you are an office landlord and looking at the occupancy. However, looking holistically at the supply of, of office stock this year, there's quite a lot of strata title supply expected to complete, just over, I think, 150,000. So in that first quarter, uh, only 9% of office supply actually completed. And I think uh, our consensus here is, you know, it's very important not to uh, discount the strata title supply. It will impact the centrally owned supply in some way. So looking at the supply and, and the occupancy or the impact on occupancy over the first quarter, uh, the, the occupancy decreased slightly by 2.3%. Uh, We're expecting it to remain relatively flat by the end of the year. And that's just based on the centrally owned supply um, catching up and be able to uptake. If we're looking at those deals that are happening across the market, on a positive note, number of deals are increasing, but they are at lower quantums uh, for slightly shorter uh, lease lengths. And those achieve rents are down on a quarter on quarter basis. We look at the completions over the first quarter. We had the third grade A uh, office building completed on Norodon Boulevard with Satapana Tower, adding uh, just over 16,000 square meters. Um, and we had another unnamed building in uh, Tol Kork, uh, adding some grade C space. We didn't see any new launches over quarter one, which also bodes fairly well in terms of uh, letting the market uh, absorb some of that office supply, which has been uh, coming online over the past couple of quarters. In terms of rents, uh, we saw positive movements uh, in the four grades that we uh, set out on the left there. I think really uh, we were expecting a, a bounce back. Uh, these are on the quoting rents, not on the achieved rents. And perhaps some of this is built in with uh, 2021 business plans, um, as well as um, 
you know, the slight recovery in the office market. It's important to remember that similar with the residential markets on those quoting sales prices and sales rents, that as these buildings fill up slightly, uh, landlords are able to ask slightly more and can be a little bit more bullish on some of those uh, figures there. I've got the Phnom Penh mobility tracker down below. I know James touched on that slightly earlier. And you can see that the, the office or the workplace mobility has remained uh, more positive uh, than the retail and recreation that I'll talk about slightly later, uh, which, which remains fairly strong. I think we discussed in the fittest forecast, work from home or work from anywhere. Uh, and I think, you know, the market is managing to adapt to that where possible but the office is still an important and vital role in business. But for the upcoming strata offices, so here we're looking at just the completions that are expected in 2021. Uh, we've put some figures on the slide there on the quoting sales prices and those quoting rents. Now th those quoting rents at $26.80 are above grade B CBD, certainly and sort of uh, are in line with what we would call prime office rents and really some of those grade A rents at the top of the market. Now these are quoting rents and I think as these buildings complete and later on in the year, those quoting rents will begin to cool uh, as that 150,000 square meters of supply competes more heavily for tenants. Um, but we'll have to see and monitor that quite closely, uh, but all those projects look to be on track to finish this year. So it'll be an interesting change to the office market uh, overall. Just to run through some of the changes in the retail market, uh, looking at the occupancy is taking quite a bit of a hammering over the first quarter, a negative 8.6% adjustment. And this is really a reaction to that increase in supply over the last three years. So you can see from 2016 to 2017, the percentage increase in supply wasn't that strong and really over the last three years, and it, certainly this year we're expecting quite a substantial amount of uh, net leasable area to enter the market, uh, that, those, uh, that that supply is going to impact the occupancy rates. And you can see in the first quarter of uh, 2021, we witnessed 19% of the expected 148,000 square meters complete. And some of, those, uh, some of those projects are expecting to complete later in the year in Q2 and Q3, still remain on track uh, unless there are any other unforeseen construction delays uh, that may occur. Uh, I know we didn't touch on what happened in the Suez Canal earlier, but you never know what may happen to supply chains at the moment. Looking at those international brand movements, so this is where we're tracking uh, really only international brands entering or expanding in the market and exiting. Uh, Q1 2021 was fairly positive. It was actually an increase on Q1 2020. And sort of, uh, if you're tracking the quarter on quarter, looks fairly well for the future. It's quite looks like it's on a sort of exponential growth rate. Some of those new entrants included American retailers uh, in the F&B and fashion, such as Papa John's and, and Ralph Lauren uh, as well. So still more dynamic, uh, still some more dynamism happening in the in the retail sector, still new entrants, which is fairly positive, And hopefully that can absorb some of the new supply completing. Here is a the completions that we witnessed over the first quarter. So we had three community malls with the Green Avenue, View Park, and Bum Snot Food Village, and one retail podium at TK Central. We didn't see any new launches again in this sector over Q1, which is also very good in terms of the occupancy and supply that we're talking about. And certainly that will have an impact on rents, which seems to be jumping around really uh, as new projects complete and as new launches get announced. Uh, so I think the retail market is struggling to find sort of a stabilized uh, rental level. But if you look at the, uh, the percentages, uh, the, the movement is in a fairly tight range in terms of dollar value. Over the first quarter, there wasn't any change to the prime shopping mall or retail podium quoting rent. Uh, there was a slight uptick in the community mall at 4%. And I think this is based on the three completions that we saw. 
over the first quarter. However, the prime high street quoting rents dropped 10%, and that's quite a significant drop. However, looking at the previous six or seven quarters, there hasn't been too much change to those prime high street rents. So I think really this is indicative of the market catching up with those landlords and having to adjust their rent. Uh, finally, whereas that adjustment already happened in those other sectors in early 2020 or at the end of 2019. Looking at the quoting rental ranges in the top right there, you can see those ranges are still fairly large. And we've put on the average rents in the yellow triangles there. And you can see that especially in the prime shopping malls and retail podiums, those averages are trending at the lower end of those ranges, uh, sort of suggesting that there are some landlords out there that are asking exceptionally high quoting rentals. And this may be based on location or project specifics. However, those average rents are coming down. I think I would expect to see throughout the rest of the year that those ranges start to become slightly smaller. Um, and it would be more clear to understand sort of those trends which are happening uh, in those rental ranges. Uh, James touched on this earlier again, but those uh, retail mobility trackers are down. I think the latest check this morning, uh, it's slightly above negative 50% but still down. And I think for anyone that is uh, driving around uh, outside or outside of the curfew hours, you can definitely see that there is less activity, less mobility uh, in the streets of Phnom Penh. I'm not really going to touch on the, on the fearless forecast. I think James covered it a little bit at the beginning there, but if you do have any questions on some of our predictions, please let us know. I'm going to open the floor now to, to questions and answers and welcome back James and Kessa uh, with me here. And I think, uh, you know, I'll start off answering maybe a more technical question, but we had a question here on, uh, on our original slide on showing a baseline and mobility against the baseline, how that baseline is calculated. Uh, so, so just to answer, we don't calculate the, the baseline. So the, these numbers come from come from uh, Google and um, they calculate the baseline against a five week period back in February. You can go onto Google's mobility website and download data for yourself. Just gonna hand over to Kessa now, who is going to be launching a poll. Kessa. Thank you, Ben. So um, as usual, we want to hear from you as well. So um, I'm launching a poll right now, if you are uh, on Zoom. You should um, be able to see the poll on your screen popping up. All right. Please let us know you cannot see um, the poll going up. Um, so the first question, as usual, we want to um, understand from your observation on the uh, changes in the business environment, whether you have seen more improvement or um, the environment is worsening off or haven't changed at all. And then uh, moving on to the second question is again um, about the uh, risk that uh, hanging around the uh, real estate investment. Uh, sorry, um, the second question is the Right. <laughs> Sorry, I think we mix up the um, um, question here. Um, but uh, the question, the intention here is to um, get to know your uh, uh, view on the risk that is uh, pressing um, challenge or, or pressure on, on the real estate uh, sector here in, in Cambodia. And the final question is um, um, on what type of asset class or uh, sector that you're looking into investing or not investing into in 2021. We're starting to see um, some uh, response coming in right now. Um, in the first question um, about the uh, equal split in between uh, um, getting better and getting worse um, in the uh, environment and some response on the risk factor as well, um, over supplies and reduction of liquidity and construction delay are leading. And finally, um, the last question on the asset type that you are investing, um, land is on the lead again. Um, and then um, some of 
you are sitting on your money this year. Um, landed property is still on the rise as well um, after land. All right, um, we'll keep the poll uh, going on, but um, we'll move on to discuss the uh, questions that you have sent in. We have received quite a number of questions already. Um, yeah, before moving on to um, uh, technical questions, um, we want to remind you again that yes, we will uh, share this uh, slide presentation with you. And you can also find it on our website. Um, please go to cbre.com.kh slash uh, research or go to the homepage and then um, go to our uh, research center tab. Um, I would like to take on um, the first question here about um, uh, no data on landed property supply in BKK district or Bunking Kong district. Is there no supply in this district? Uh, particularly, yes, actually, um, Bunking Kong district is, uh, if you know, uh, it is a new district splitting from Chum Kham Mon. Um, currently, there's no um, landed property supply in Bunking Kong. However, we've seen uh, a few supply um, in Chum Kamon, namely uh, Waray Chum Kamon or Ushim Basa, Basa Garden, uh, which were uh, established early in the 2000s. Mm. James, would you like to take on um, the next question on a uh, number of approved projects and the trends of these projects? Sure, thank you, Kessa. Yeah, so um, we have seen an uptick in the number of improved projects but that doesn't necessarily mean that those have started yet. In fact, it's unlikely that they have. Um, some of them might be in the very early stages, but it would be too early to know uh, whether or not there was any serious delay on those. Um, in part because the people who, who gain approval can wait a, a year or so before they, they start construction. Um, I think when we look at the general trends, there hasn't been a significant uptick in construction delays because of the 20th of February event, which is, is good. Uh, construction supply chains typically remain as robust as they were in the latter part of last year, but there are still issues, particularly glass facades. So once you have the structure ready and um, it's about to take on, on its facade, uh, getting the glass into Cambodia at the moment is, is pretty challenging. Uh, there seems to be quite a backlog there. Um, and that is where a lot of, lot of projects are, are facing delay. We're also seeing some projects which maybe haven't got this pathway to profit that we were talking about during the fearless forecast as also uh, being slower in their delivery. And that's uh, a response to the market dynamics. And we can expect that trend to increase. And what we're seeing is a, an attempted approach at uh, finding alternative occupier routes to de-risk those projects. So some of the developers that have built projects where perhaps there isn't a clear pathway to profit or they haven't been as successful in disposing of the asset as they first thought, or the situation around the asset has changed, we are seeing a different approach. So they're looking at maybe repositioning that asset or looking at a different occupier method. So in some cases that might be head leasing, for example, um, where there is some opportunities in the market. However, the same dynamics are at play and the rental rates and the risks in, in all sectors are being factored in by head lease operators, as well as, as by tenants and the investors and developers themselves. So certainly some more delays expected, but not that, uh, not that visible yet from the 20th of February event anyway. It's more a general dynamic. Thank you, James. Um, we've got a question on a uh, retail uh, sector here. Um, our audience asks, um, when will the retail market uh, return back to the pre-COVID situation? Okay, I'll uh, take that one on as well. Um, 
good question. I think that we could look at the Google mobility chart and we could say that retail was returning to its baseline in the early part of quarter one. However, this situation has knocked it back several months. So it isn't as though uh, the retail market is going to be the same as it was before. There are significant structural changes in the sector, particularly if you look at food and beverage and the rise of um, the food delivery apps. So some, some key factors have changed and the way people are shopping is also adjusted. Uh, and the, the, the construction development of retail projects continues on. So uh, footfall spread across uh, different retail environment is um, going to be be thinner um, and the developers and the retailers were are going to have to work a little bit harder to, to capture more of that footfall so there are some um, some really interesting dynamics in the retail sector right now we can say that if you look at google mobility alone yeah it shouldn't be too long after this um, covid risk has receded before uh, retail can can return to to that, but it's only one metric. And um, whilst there is talk about revenge shopping, which is uh, people starting to to buy more after COVID um, kind of recedes in their market and they're allowed out and they're allowed to the shops again, we haven't necessarily had so much impact here in that every even non-essential shops in the majority are able to to be open but i know for one as soon as cinema is going to open again uh many of my colleagues will be back there so at least um in some respect we will see see that trend uh here in cambodia okay um all right ben a question for you how do you think developer loans are affecting the market right now so i think this is a question on development financing Sure. Yeah, I think over the last three months, especially, I, I've been getting asked lots of questions about construction financing, development financing, refinancing of assets. And it's definitely uh, a, a big talking point and something a lot of people are interested in at the moment. Um, I think really, uh, you know, development financing still seems to be there from what I can tell in the market. So we are seeing new projects. It's important to remember that most of these these projects are sort of financed through the sales or have been historically so those are sort of developers managing their finances through sales or pre-sales and so on and so forth but i think you know potentially what's more interesting at the moment is uh that those completed projects or those what we would call standing investments looking at refinancing so they may have had construction loans and have been operating for a year or two years and I think really that the market may be getting to the stage where you can get a specialist real estate lender starting to emerge. And whether that's through the stock market or listing and getting financing through uh, purchase of shares on the public market, or whether that's through a private, uh, private person or company that wants to issue debt on real estate specifics, uh, it would be very interesting to see that emerge. From what I understand at the moment, it's fairly difficult uh, for a lot of these banks. Uh, Cambodia's got quite a lot of banks entering the markets, but their lending books aren't large enough to support some of those really large developments at the moment. So as those banks grow and compete and those interest rates come down further and the bank balance sheets get larger, I will start to see much more real estate financing and I think probably some diversification into specific assets. So you'll start to see some of those mortgage lenders really emerge and those commercial lenders emerge uh, quite distinctly from each other. Um, I think, you know, there's lots of questions about uh, landed property. We're trying to cover the, the whole suite of uh, Phnom Penh at the moment. So I think, you know, Kessa, do you want to answer some of these questions that we've got here in terms of, of, of landed, landed property? I think uh, property prices in Tak Mau or the movement away from the city center is quite an interesting topic. Uh, thank you, Ben. Yeah, um, I'll probably can combine some of these questions together because um, uh, several of them are around pricing uh, across the city. Um, <clears throat> 
first question on um, the movement in the Khmer. So um, uh, yes, the Khmer is although outside of um, administrative uh, boundary of Phnom Penh, also seeing a major improvement in infrastructure um, and uh, commercial movement uh, somehow that also leading to uh, further residential um, uh, flow into the area as well. Um, also given the distance um, in between Takmao and Phnom Penh is quite close and the upcoming new international airport uh, being constructed, uh, Takmao is becoming uh, more attractive um, uh, as well as the area in uh, further in Long Cao and Min Che that are closer to Takmao. Um, average pricing in this area right now is um, probably it's hard to uh, give an indicative price uh, at the moment because um, products type arranging are uh, vary and the locations are also vary um, off main road on main road. So benchmarking, I think um, uh, shop houses um, quite um, advanced. <coughs> Sorry, um, quite a good uh, shop house uh, locating on National Road, T, road 2. Um, close to the Kamal, you're probably expecting the price range of um, over 28, um, uh, sorry, 280,000 to over 300,000, uh, um, depending on the distance from the, the, the Kamal city. And then um, um, off road to um, you know other roads in in and around Takmao, uh, you probably can find um, a hundred square meter uh, flat house of um, uh, you know for for living purpose, not for business purpose, of course, um, and uh, over a uh, hundred thousand to uh, in the range of two hundred thousand US dollar. Mm -hmm. Um, same questions on the price range in uh, Force and J that we're seeing here on um, uh, an example of a hundred uh, square meter uh, flat house as well. Um, I think in Force and J right now, same same, same situation uh, across uh, other districts depending on the location of that project and location of that unit itself. So on main road, uh, probably looking at um, a price range of um, uh, over uh, at least uh, 150,000 to uh, over 200,000 uh, in some cases. And uh, for residential uh, flats that are off the main road are uh, probably in the range of between 100,000 to uh, 120,000 per units. All right. Um, there's a question on the uh, industrial uh, market, although uh, it's not in uh, our coverage today, but I think, uh, um, uh, Jane, maybe you want to take on this uh, question on, do you have any data about new investor in the industrial park? Um, uh, industrial is still very much of interest. And I think it is probably the area of the market right now, which is the hottest in the region. So if we look at Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Laos, uh, industrial still is, is um, really right at the top there in terms of uh, investment activity. So industrial is certainly an area where we expect to see more investment coming in. And yeah, there are more inquiries this year than last year um, for the quarter in terms of industrial uh, investors, developers and occupiers. Uh, is it significant? Not yet. Um, it's still going to take some time. And I think probably what the investors are looking for is more of a proven financial model uh, in order that they can be confident to get a, a decent return on what they need to put in, particularly on the infrastructure investment that's required for uh, some of the industrial parts that, that are needed. Uh, so some more opportunities to capitalize on that. Uh, for foreign, very experienced industrial developers would, would I think, go down pretty well. Uh, so we can hope and expect to see some of that activity. I think it would be, be a good thing for the market um, and, and for the occupiers. So uh, industrial, yeah, one to watch, but still a little bit slow right now for Cambodia compared with, with the rest of the region. Okay, uh, there's some questions here on the office market. Uh, and are we seeing uh, an improvement in 
inquiry quality, i.e. are people looking at um, better quality stock rather than, than the older stuff? Uh, yes, in part, they are looking at, at um, higher quality, but the biggest driver for them at the moment is, is cost. So anywhere where they can keep down the cost of CapEx uh, and basically the fit out cost when they go in, as well as achieving a really good rental rate is what they're after. And landlords are responding to this at the moment. Um, many of them have done already. Gap between quoting and achieved rent has been growing quite consistently. So there are some, some fairly um, big impacts uh, happening and driving changes in the office segment. Um, however, I would say that that people do still remain a bit wary of relocation. Uh, some of them are taking the plunge, particularly at the end of quarter four and the start of quarter one. As their budgets for 2021 got approved, they were able to make some decisions and grow. Perhaps they've been putting that off for some time. And renewals are less prevalent than they were in the early part of 2020. And I think that's because the change in many people's business has crystallized a bit uh, in the latter part of last year. So they had a clearer vision of where they wanted to go, how big they were going, going to be, how much money they had to spend. So um, these are all important factors. Okay, there are some questions here on land and building prices and whether there are assets uh, which are considered to be depressed at the moment. Um, these are lovely questions, so I'll hand these over to Ben uh, <laughs> to, to give you an answer. Yeah, th thanks, James. I think, uh, yeah, another another very popular question, what, what can I buy for cheap at the moment? Uh, <laughs> really, I think, when we're looking at the market, it just comes down to who's under pressure. So some of the more interesting or exciting assets that people are, are looking for, some of those prime plots in the central locations, they're not really depressed at the moment because those owners uh, have fairly large stockpiles of cash or managed to uh, reappropriate their funds elsewhere. Uh, and, and they're staying fairly confident and are not in a, what we would say, forced sales situation. However, some of the more mid-tier uh, investors or developers that may be buying smaller plots uh, in less desirable locations have come under some pressure and are sort of in this situation where they would be in distress. So buying some of those sorts of assets may be better, I think really the gap between expectation on price between the buyer and seller is still fairly significant at the moment. So actually uh, trying to get agreed deals is still slightly challenging in some areas. Uh, that gap between uh, those pricings should, uh, should be reduced as we move throughout the year. And hopefully there'll be a little bit more movement and activity across the market. We've already begun to see that uh, in the first three months. There's definitely a lot more interest and a lot more traction uh, with these buyers and sellers uh, on different sorts of assets uh, across really the whole country. Um, there is a question here on uh, Sianokville. We do have data on uh, Sianokville at the moment. I think it's going to get very interesting, uh, especially in half two of this year. And we're, we're keeping our eye on it. We have. Uh, plan some uh, research excursions and some reports. At the moment, we're writing a report on wider Phnom Penh or the south and beyond, uh, and we'll be updating you on that later. Uh, just want to say that this slide deck will be made available uh, online and you can access it uh, via our website, uh, which should be on screen now. Uh, link on the side there. And as well, we'll have our usual written form report with all the numbers, uh, percentages, changes, and tables uh, for your reading pleasure, which should also be up online this morning, uh, the, this afternoon. Uh, you'll all get an email with the slide deck and links to where you can access this stuff. Keep an eye out on our Facebook and LinkedIn for more events and more reports. If you do have any more specific questions, please feel free to get in touch with either James, myself, or Kessa, who will be more than happy to answer 
uh, these questions. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. We kept closer on time than we did on our uh, last presentation. I'd like to thank uh, James and Kessa, uh, but it's bye from me.